Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And we've got another of our top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology. Exciting times. 2020 already, huh? 2020 already. Hopefully it'll improve our vision. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's already six days in and I haven't heard that joke yet. <laughs> you must run in different circles than I do. Yeah, yeah. It's like getting the free coffee at McDonald's. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So. Um, so we got a case here? Yeah. So the top 25 pearls. That's a thing, huh? The top 25 pearls, yeah. Wow, of the lung pathology. Well, uh, useful, useful if you ever get lung biopsies, and I think everyone's going to get If you see one. lung biopsies for interstitial lung disease, these 25 pearls will help you avoid putting your foot in it. In it. Yeah. Yeah, so this particular topic we're doing right now is what to do with the blue lung biopsy. The blue biopsy. Yeah. Now, usually when I have a blue biopsy, I'm thinking about tumors. Right. Those like small nasty cell. Nasty cellular yeah, tumors. Something. Small cell, poorly diffed no, blah, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. But we're talking about ILD blue biopsies. So blue means lymphocytes. Blue means inflammatory cells. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of things that can give you blue biopsies. It's a broad differential diagnosis, but we're going to go through and we're going to highlight with these series of cases, we're going to highlight the ones that are most important for you to consider and remember when you're making a diagnosis. And the cool thing is, they all have the same elements. All the things that make the blue biopsy that are not tumor have all the same inflammatory elements. They're just mixed up, sometimes a little differently, and the patient's clinical and radiology is a little bit different. It's a little different, and you, you can navigate one to the other. And you might say, who cares? And the clinicians do care, as we'll see in this particular case. Exactly. So, so this case was a 39-year-old woman. 39-year-old woman, evaluated um, at the uh, outside hospital. Shortness of breath and cough. Shortness of breath and cough. We didn't know uh, any of the imaging studies, right? Right. And the uh, the pathologist identified a bunch of lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate within the interstitial period. Right. Right. Right, including some aggregates and nodules. Of, uh, of inflammatory cells. And so the, the diagnosis that was rendered on this case was? Lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. Lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. Now, if any of you have watched our videos, and Max will put a, a tag on this Put a link. He put a link because if you haven't watched the video we just did, you might be thinking, cool, LIP. Right, finally a case of LIP. But if you watch the videos, you'd be like, LIP, LIP doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And so, apropos, this case was called lymphoid interstitial pneumonia because it had a lot of lymphocytes, and it was in the interstitium, and there was even a little organizing pneumonia around yep. with it, little patches. Like right here. Look at that, little tufts of organizing pneumonia. What could be a better combination of findings to fit into what sounds like Right. And I'll tell you, pneumonia. if you go to the textbook and you pull down the textbook and you look look in the chapter and you're flipping through with this biopsy and you don't see ILD on a regular basis and you get to something called lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, you're Bingo. like, yes, got it. I've got it. This is this must be what it is. So you render a diagnosis of lymphoid interstitial pneumonia and the pulmonologist says, wait a minute. What? I... I, I I thought lymphoid interstitial pneumonia was cystic lung disease. That's my understanding, she says. My understanding is that's cystic that, lung that's, disease. That's a, that's a cystic lung disease, bilateral cysts. And you go, really? You go, oh. Because LIP for us is a cellular infiltrate in the lung parenchyma without cysts. There's no cysts. There's no the, cysts. There's no cysts. So we got a disconnect. We got a problem. And then the clinician says, if you read my note, you realize I have a very high suspicion this, that this patient has an autoimmune disease uh, systemically. And I think this lung disease is like RA or something like that. So I was hoping you were going to tell me something about whether it's a UIP pattern of RA, RA or an NSIP pattern of RA, or whether you think it's scleroderma with vascular changes. Or whether you think it's compatible with the CTD associated ILD at all. Or whether it's even IPATH, right? Not a defined connective tissue disease, but lots of findings that fit it. Exactly. So, so th this case got sent out to us, and, and this case highlights actually what I think is probably the most important 
uh, pearl when we're talking about the blue biopsy pearl. Right. And the blue biopsy pearl, the most important one in my opinion, is that you should have a very low threshold to suggest the possibility of a connective tissue disease, especially in a biopsy with a lot of lymphoid infiltrate, right. like this one. And I would go even further to say that when you have a combination, like we see in this field, of organizing pneumonia and fibrin, which organizing pneumonia and fibrin tells you you've got injury at the time of the biopsy, one to two weeks before the biopsy, and if you have that in association with all the rest of these lymphoid infiltrates, germinal centers, this is a connective tissue disease associated ILD until there's very good evidence to suggest otherwise. And then diagnose it as IPATH. <laughs> diagnose it as, as <laughs> IPATH. Interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. Unless you know the patient has RA or lupus right. or something else. Right. But we don't di use the term IPATH. We could suggest it in a comment that this might qualify as so-called IPAF. Interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune fe features. Now look at this biopsy again, Max. Slow down, go back to low mag. It looks to me like this is not only blue, but it's a little bit patchy or nodular, wouldn't you say? It does. I mean, like this is involved, nodule there, this nodule is involved, there. this is involved. This and you know, my, my penchant is that everything that's nodular under the microscope airway is airway is associated. And isn't it interesting that connective tissue diseases love the airways. My famous phrase is, RA loves the airway. I like it. I like it. Why might that be? Well, you've got your native immune system that sets up right along the, the bronchovascular yeah. bundle. Yep. So this is a, a, a fantastic case because as Max said, it really shows you heterogeneity of injury, uh, acute, subacute, and chronic, and suggests an ongoing process of injury with resolving or healing in the background. Kind of like the term we use for UIP, but completely different because this is an active inflammatory picture, not the dense fibrotic picture of UIP. Exactly. Now, this is an abnormal pleura. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking about what are other features that we can use to help us say, oh, maybe this is a connective tissue disease as opposed to the other things that we might run across in the setting of the blue biopsy. Well, we always say to look at the pleura because the pleura is a separate organ from the lung, come from different embryologic derivation. So when things affect the lung, they can spill into the pleura, but usually very focally like a pneumonia where the pneumonia will run across the pleura and make an empyema. But when the pleura is diffusely and chronically abnormal with say fibrosis and pleuritis, and the lung also has an inflammatory injury, you should think about a systemic disease affecting both organs. And connective tissue disease is at the top of that list. When you've got a mixture like this of cellular interstitial pneumonia with chronic pleuritis, chronic fibrotic pleural thickening, those, that, those are the cases where you should really be considering And we want to diagnose a CTD in the lung. If you've got a patient with shortness of breath and cough and abnormal function, and you find something that looks like connective tissue disease they weren't, the clinician wasn't thinking of, if they diagnose that disease and treat the patient aggressively, as people are treated today with autoimmune diseases, they have a good chance of extending this patient's functional life. Absolutely. I mean, it's a huge thing. And perhaps preventing some more systemic manifestations because you've caught it early. Because what some percentage? 20 15%, 20%, 20% of 15, 20% of patients will present with pulmonary manifestations first, even prior to serologic manifestations. Right. So the lung is not really just another joint, but it can be the only joint involved in involved. some connective tissue diseases. So again, the pearl have a low threshold to suggest a connective tissue disease workup, even if the patient uh, has already been seen by a rheumatologist and deemed no connective tissue disease identified. Ask them, did they get a CRP? Did they get an ESR? How extensive has their autoimmune workup been? I mean, just a, just a negative ANA isn't enough. No. You've got to do a more extensive panel, including antisynthetase, yeah, antimyositis antibodies. They can be they can be it there, and nobody knows it until you suggest getting it, and all of a sudden a Joe one comes back, and it's positive. Exactly. So this case to me is connective tissue disease until proven otherwise. Excellent case. Thanks, right. Max. Thank you, Kevin. Thank what you. What should we advise our viewers to do now? Uh, don't forget to like and comment below. Hope you guys have a good one.